this night of this shooting, um, your brother says he was there, but he had left. So when this incident even occurred, he wasn't even there. No, he wasn't. Okay. He wasn't. Why, why is it that your brother believes that you had something to do with him going away for eight months? Because in court documents it says that I mentioned his name and I said he was there, but that never happened. So you were saying bro, and they took it as meaning your brother? Yes. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so this happens, he goes away for eight months, uh, and he believes that you and your girlfriend uh, say something to the police, but you're saying that you didn't. Yes. And you explain that you don't want to go visit Miguel, you did twice, but eight months, but you say that it's hard to see your brother in jail. Which I can imagine, like some people don't like going to the hospital and visiting people that are sick or dying because uh, it's just hard for them. And you're saying that's the case with only seeing your brother twice? Like, with that issue, Steve, be honest with you, I was in that courtroom. I had faith in the justice system because I'm like, he really didn't do it, he wasn't there. Like, there's no way he's going to get found guilty. So I didn't, the whole, during the whole proceedings and everything, like, I didn't have no worries. I didn't second guess it, like it could go wrong or none of that because thinking like, all right, everybody telling the truth here. So he's gonna and, be good. And was it your gun? Yes. Do you feel like responsible because your gun was the one that was used in the shooting? And that's why I, I haven't forgave myself yet. And that's why when he said, you didn't come see me, this is why I didn't go see him. Because it's like, me and my brother were close, you get what I'm saying? Just stupidity. Like, having the gun out, not being responsible, holding your own purchase caused all this. Because if you would have kept it on you, or if you would have put it in a safe spot, besides in the bar, just letting it linger, none of this would have never happened. And correct me if I'm wrong. It seems like everything you're addressing right now is directed at bias. Well, bias is the oldest. And he's always been the big brother. And I expect him to try to get past. I understand what he, but yeah. don't get me wrong. I understand completely. Well, right, because it's got to be tough to be an innocent man spending eight months <laughs> in prison. Definitely. Right. But I said to him, I said to him when all this was going on, I said, Bias, brace yourself. I said, because it's not the jury fault, because it's not hard when you got your brother and his girlfriend a witness for the state. Now, when you so say witness you for the state, what does that mean? They had him on the stand as a witness that he said that he was there, him and his Th girlfriend. So he said Bias they, was there? He didn't say it at the hearing, at, on the stand. Right. But this is what the state was putting him up there to say that he said. Did he ever testify against his brother? No, no, when he got up there, he said, I did not tell the, the police that. The officer said that okay. he said it. So he, yeah. didn't, he so, didn't incriminate his brother? No, he didn't say that he said it. The, th the problem I had with the whole thing, Steve, is there should have been more done. And like Bayer said, he really didn't believe that he was going to jail because he believed in the system. And he didn't, right. You know, but I, I try to explain to my kids, okay? Yeah, it's black and white. But it's also gray areas. Bice, you ain't the first person who went to jail for something you didn't do. And you ain't gonna be the last. But at some point, son, you gotta get your life back. You can't keep dwelling on this. What if you're somewhere to fail this lie detector test? Well, I, I, it, I, is it gonna even be imaginable that they could patch things up? It, it's going to be. It's going to have to be. It's going to have to be, regardless. Like I said, I don't care what these results are. We're going to fix this. We're going to fix this. I certainly... And you're going to be more careful in the things that you get into. Uh, Bias, you came took a lie detector test. Yes. And we asked you, regarding the 2016 incident outside that club, did you fire that handgun? You answered no, and the result of your lie detector test is that you told the truth. Yeah. 
I feel terrible. I mean, I feel bad for you. You know, you're telling the truth. You lost eight months with your son. You lost eight months of your life. Can't, like I said, can't be easy being in prison and uh, for something that you had, you weren't even there. That's too bad. Uh, Brittany, you took a lie detector test. We asked you regarding the 2016 incident outside that club, did you tell police that Baez was the shooter? You answered no. The result for your lie detector test is that you told the truth. Brother, no matter what, I would never take you away from your family like that. I would never do that to you. No matter what, blood cannot make us thicker. I would never do that to you. You are my brother regardless. I would never do that. And I love you, and I just want you to know that. <laughs> Deshaun took a lie to talk to Tust. And we asked him, regarding the 2016 incident outside that club, did you tell police that your brother was the shooter? You answered no. And the results for your lie to talk to Tust is that you told the truth. <laughs> I'm curious yeah. as what you're feeling right now. I'm so happy, you know, me and my brother back to normal. You know? <laughs> my, mom, my mom can have her kids back. You know, my mom can have her kids uh, you, back. You gotta be really happy, huh? <laughs> because, listen, I, I know this just happened on stage. Uh, I don't expect it to go right back to second, because it takes time it's to heal. It's right back already. Right. I it's hope right so. Back. I hope so. It's right back. I'm, I'm really happy for your family. <laughs> um, obviously, they were telling the truth, but nobody's going to blame you the way you were feeling, being put in a position that you were in. And. If you say it's right back, I'm glad for you, and I hope that's the case. Yeah, it's back. <laughs> but I would say this. You said it earlier. Could have been a lot worse. Yeah. Somebody could have been dead. You could have went away for a long time. Maybe you go away, you don't even get to ever hold your son, right? I would just warn everybody, if you're living the kind of life you need to carry a gun, and you're going out to nightclubs and everything else, maybe spend more time at home. Because if you're doing things, you know, where people, you know, guns are going off, people can get shot, your brother's going to jail for something he didn't do for eight months, you might need to make some changes in your life. So something more tragic doesn't happen. Get out of that town. Nobody's going to say you running from nothing. Leave that town. It's toxic. It's trouble. <laughs> And I'll leave it at that. Mom knows best. Good luck to you. In 1987, I was accused of gross sexual imposition. I did not commit this crime, but I was accused of it and went to prison for 18 months, and it destroyed my life. I was accused of allowing a man violate this little girl 
and I'm supposed to have watched this crime. And around the same time, a neighbor accused me of touching her breast and buttocks. I would never harm or violate any child or a little girl, little boy, anybody. I was in the military and my job was to serve and protect the public. I couldn't violate nobody. I was totally dedicated to the National Guard. I ended up pleading guilty because I had no other option. I didn't have no lawyer in my corner. I paid a lawyer, he wanted to get out, he got his money, boom, I was done. So when I got out, at age 15, Brandy found me. I got custody of her and she's been in my life ever since. And we've got a great relationship. So having her my back in my life was a joy feeling. Things got a little rocky. She, she had accused me of touching or molesting one of her kids. She accused me of touching the, one of her children's privates, and it's false. I don't get why Brandy done this to me and said this, because she let me, they stayed with me. They stayed with me for two years. She'll send me these text messages over her phone calling me a child molester. Uh, I've touched her kids. Uh, and accused me of heinous stuff that there's no way I could do, and I don't know why. I don't know why she accused me of things like this. I love my grandkids more than my life. I love my grandkids more than the world. I would do anything for my grandkids. I play music, I get them involved in what I'm in. I do everything for them boys, for her, and I still get accused of things that I am not or have not done. She's also accused my wife of hitting the kids and me standing there and just watching. And I don't need this. I don't need this and neither does Annie. I want Brandy to know that she's a very confused person. And I'm not that monster. I am not evil. I am not sick. And I'm here to clear my name. Uh, Brandy, why did you call the show? It's, it's devastating knowing that my father had went to prison for something that he had, that's allegedly did. How, that's something that you just, you, I just can't get out of my head. Um, what was your father, Tom, convicted of in 1987? My father was convicted of gross sexual imposition of a minor. Um, while another man had, wa had done it, he had watched this happen. He had supposedly put her, penetrated her. So another man uh, penetrated a young child with a broomstick and your father watched. watched it happen. Um, what happened in 2017 with one of your sons? So in 2017, my had came into the room and told me that his papa, his papa. Meaning Tom. Yes, had touched him in that area. So I was concerned. I asked him, are you sure? But at the same time, he had just had a procedure done in that area. So, you know, I was like, well, you know, because they weren't in my custody at the time. They were just staying with Tom and Annie. And, and can I just yeah, ask sorry. you why? Because I was, I lost my home, Steve. I lost my home, my car, my job, my mom, my best friend. This incident that happened in 1987, what happened with this little girl? I didn't do nothing. This guy that's supposed to have done this in front of me, he didn't do nothing in front of me with this little girl. But he, did, he didn't get no time at all. They just jumped on me and but said... But you plead guilty to it, huh? You know what, Brandy? You plead guilty okay, to hold it. Because on it you know, hold on a second. So you're saying there was a guy accused of penetrating a girl with a broomstick, yeah. right? And you allegedly watched, right? Allegedly. Allegedly. Okay. He didn't get any jail time? No. No. But you did? Yes. For watching. Yeah. And how long did you go to prison for? 18 months. 18 months. So but I was facing 20 years, and I, my lawyer said, if you don't take a plea, you can stay here and rot. I was like, no, and man, you're supposed to represent. This is the lawyer you were paying for. Yeah, I paid a paid lawyer. I okay. I'm Tom's common law wife, and uh, we've been together about five years. There's no way he would have done this. He's a sweet, gentle man. He loves children. He would never do anything to hurt a child. I know in 1987, Tom plea bargained to a horrible crime. He did not do it. He was railroaded into it, I believe. 
his daughter lost her home and her car and uh, said and Tom said can we bring the three boys over to live with you and I'll live here too and uh, that's how it all started and they the boys stayed with me for about two and a half years took him to school got him into all kinds of activities and basically was the grandmother they never had so all I did was love her kids I raised them basically as my own uh, and she resented that she would accuse me of beating the kids, uh, locking them in basements. Brandy has called the police to our house at least five times. And the uh, police are always very nice. They, they know us. And uh, they've even apologized. They said, we know who Brandy is. We know what she's like. When she calls, we have to come and check. The whole situation is totally ridiculous. I've never dealt with anything quite so crazy. Tom can't change Brandy. Nobody can change Brandy except Brandy herself. I took a lie detector test today because of Brandy's accusations against me, and I want to prove that I did not ever abuse those boys. You I realize was, that I what we've done for the boys, you do not you care. You took the only thing away from Calm me down, that Brandy. I had we left. We never took anything and away from you. And then rubbed it in my face, Annie. We you never took anything away face. from you. We wanted you, you to be a good mother. We, we wanted you to be able to take your no, own, you care of your own kids. No, I was just hurt. When you hear his daughter calling him a child molester, keep throwing in his face. Uh, and, I hate it. And it sounds like Tom has done a lot for his daughter. He has. I am very appreciative of it. But you don't understand what I was going through either. My mother died. My best friend, I didn't have, I was a single parent all my life. Well, and but when then, my kids okay, are, but why, I, I just, like, I understand. I should have never accused him. But, but, you know, throw in his face, you're a child molester. I, some of those texts, I got the power. No, like, it's this. It's, what the hell is that? What power do you have? Because to the back of my head, I do don't. I, I don't. I'm not 100 percent sure. Right. Uh, Annie, you came here and you took a lie detector test, and we asked you, did you ever cause any type of physical abuse to Tom's three grandchildren at any time? You answered no. Did you ever cause any welts, bruises, or marks at any time on Tom's three grandchildren? that is considered physical abuse? You answered no. The results came back the same to those two questions. And it came back that Annie told the truth. <laughs> Tom, let's find out. We broke gears into two parts, one with the grandchildren and one with the 1987 crime. First, we're doing the 1987 crime. We asked you, Regarding the 1987 crime you went to jail for, did you at any time engage in any f physical sexual acts to that little girl? You answered no. Regarding the 1987 crime you went to jail for, were you present observing when that little girl was sexually molested? You answered no. Regarding the 1987 crime you went to jail for, did you arrange for that little girl to be sexually molested by another man you knew? You answered no. The result came back the same to each one of those three questions. And it came back that Tom told the truth. <laughs> Brandy, uh, you took a lie detector test. And we asked you, uh, did you ever make up and fabricate a story that Annie physically abused your children at any time? And you answered yes. Yeah. So you I told, was hurt. You told the truth. Yeah. Did you ever make up and fabricate a story of allegations that Tom, your dad, physically abused your children? And you answered yeah. yes. You did fabricate, and you told the truth. So she admits <laughs> that she made up the allegations against I you. I should never did it. And Tom, I, I'm sorry, Brian. How old are you again? Thirty-five. Thirty-five. When do you get your <laughs> together? You're not eighteen. You're not twenty-one. You're a 35-year-old girl woman. You're Stop <laughs> being a victim, okay? That's all I'm saying. <laughs> Thanks for coming on. Okay. And I, I want to hear from you, Brandy. I want you to know that you're taking steps to rebuild all this, okay? Yes, sir. All right, good luck to you. Thank you. Valentino was only 22 when he was sentenced to 30-plus years to life in prison for murder, a murder that another man confessed to multiple times. Valentino had a hard time adjusting to prison life and used art as a way to escape his reality. But little did he know, 27 years after his incarceration, 
His artwork would be the key to unlocking his freedom. Take a look. My name is Valentino Dixon. I spent 27 years in prison for a crime I didn't commit. Some say I drew myself out of prison. I love to draw as a kid. I have been drawing since the age of three years old. I started going to performing arts high school in the eighth grade and I graduated in 12th grade. Art was my passion and this is what I love to do. I grew up in a drug infested neighborhood, a lot of crime, drug activity, uh, gang members and stuff like that. And it's easy to get caught up, easy to be around the wrong crowd. And this is what happens. I was at a popular hangout. I went across the street to get a beer. I was reaching in the cooler and I heard shots. I ran outside, jumped in my car and pulled off. I was out driving and I was pulled over and I was taken into custody. My car was confiscated, my clothes were confiscated and the detectives told me if I fired a weapon, then it would show up in the forensics. That it would be gun powder residue or some type of forensics on my clothing in my car. However, the results were never turned over. 27 years later, we found out that those items were tested and cleared me of the crime. Witnesses came forth and the person that committed the crime confessed to the shooting. All of these witnesses and the shooter was disregarded. I knew the evidence was there and I had no doubt that I would be cleared. However, my attorney failed to call any of the witnesses over the years, I passed two polygraph tests and that still wasn't enough. It took the Georgetown students to get involved to do a documentary where the prosecutor admitted that the clothes, my clothes and the car uh, came back uh, negative for any type of forensic or gunpowder residue. They had never turned over. They had disregarded the person responsible for the crime two days after the shooting. And 27 years later, they brought him in and he confessed again and I was released. My sentence was 39 years to life. However, when the judge read it off, all I could think was I was in the episode of the Twilight Zone. You know, I didn't even think of the sentence. Yeah, and there's no way that anybody can do 39 years to life. I survived by drawing up to 10 hours a day the last 20 years of my prison sentence. My uncle told me, he said, if you can reclaim your talent, you can reclaim your life. I had not drawn or painted in seven years. During the eighth year, he sent me some art supplies and I started drawing every day and I never stopped. I had become known as the artist in Attica. Some people called me the prison Picasso. And the warden said, hey, Valentino, would you draw my favorite golf hole? I never golfed before. I knew nothing about golf. I, I grew up in the inner city and the only thing we played was football and basketball as a sport. And he asked me to draw his favorite golf hole. I drew it, 12th hole of Augusta. He loved it. One of my neighbors said, Valentine, you should draw more golf holes. I said, what the hell are you talking about? I'm not drawing no more golf holes, you know? And he tossed some old golf digest magazines on my bunk. About a month later, I started drawing golf courses. About six months later, I had about 40 golf drawings and I was just racking up a portfolio. I wrote the Golf Digest and I explained to them what was going on, what happened to me, and they decided to publish my story, which led to Georgetown University and the Golf Channel doing a documentary, which eventually led to my freedom. I was arrested on my mother's birthday. I'm the only child. When I went to prison, my daughter Valentina was six months old. It's the worst feeling in the world to know that you can't be there for your daughter. and your mother and your family is going through this pain with you and they're in the jail cell with you every day. I never gave up hope that my day would come and that's what kept me going all that time. But the reality was there was always something in the back of my head that was telling me that you may spend the rest of your life in prison. And when they brought me to court and I was released, I can't tell you the feeling that was going inside of me. You know, it was the greatest feeling in the world. I walked out of prison with over 900 drawings, but I said, now the real work gets done. I started a prison reform foundation called Art of Freedom. I've been commissioned by some of the most famous people in the world to draw their, their golf course. Uh, Michelle Obama purchased a piece 
from me for Barack Obama. I was arrested at 21 years old. I walked out of prison at 48. And I had my moments of being bitter, angry, upset, frustrated, but I've never allowed that to change who I am, not in after 27 years of wrongful imprisonment. Life is too short. You spent 27 years in prison for murder, uh, for a crime you didn't commit. Did you ever think, I'm never gonna get out of here? Well, let me say this. Anything is possible, all right? I had read up to 700 books when I was in prison. So if I wasn't drawing, I was reading. And I read a lot of inspirational stuff. And I told myself, as long as you don't give up, you're going to get your freedom, okay? Even, even if I had to do the whole prison sentence, Steve, okay, and walk out of there at 62 years old, okay, I was determined to clear my name. I mean, I wrote a thousand letters to reporters. Of course, I was ignored. And it wasn't until the warden asked me to draw his favorite golf hole that things started looking up. I didn't understand at the time, you know, what course I was going down with this golf thing because I had never golfed before, and I'm from the inner city. Right. And my neighbor encouraged me to draw more golf holes. And why, I don't know, but I did. He threw some Golf Digest magazines on my bunk, and I started drawing them every day. It's the weirdest thing in the world, Steve, because I, I didn't even care for golf. I didn't know anything about the sport. Anyway, after six months, I sent one of the drawings and a letter to the Golf Digest magazines. The Golf Digest magazine, they took an interest in my story, man. And that right there was such a huge accomplishment. And they came to the prison, interviewed me, and followed the Golf Channel and other media outlets. You know, and if it wasn't for the golf uh, artwork, I believe that I would still be in prison. Now, you get exonerated. We had that little clip of you walking out of prison. What was that? Like, you know, you're waiting 27 years for freedom. And you come, you know, they open up that gated Attica. You come walking out. What is that feeling like? Steve, I thought I was, I thought I was gonna fall down the steps. My knees were so weak <laughs> that if you watch the clip, you'll see me taking tiny steps, walking down the steps. And I said, you know what? In front of all these people, I know I'm going to fall, you know? <laughs> and at that moment, I just I just wanted to raise my hands up and thank God and just say thank you, yeah. you know? So your daughter, uh, Valentina, is joining us. Let's bring her in. You know, it, this is just an incredible story on so many different levels. Um, you know, your father, as a young man, goes to prison for a crime he doesn't commit. Is there anything you want to say to your father? Yeah. <laughs> Dad, you've been so strong for our family over these years, and I really admire your endurance. But now it's time to relax. It's time to live while we still have the time. And I love you, Dad. I love you, too. <laughs> and I just, I just want to say, Valentino, I'm a golfer. I, I, I golf every day. And I, I do love your drawings. I mean, it, uh, they're really beautiful. And uh, you, you just do great work. And uh, I, I'm sure you're bringing a lot of happiness into people's lives through your drawings. So uh, I'm really, uh, I'm so proud to do this story. I'm so happy to do it. And I wish you, you know, many, many years of spending time together with the two of you and with your grandkids and, and just have a healthy and drama-free the rest of your life. Yeah. Let me say this, Steve, before you. we go. You know, she's one of the reasons why I would never give up, okay? And in life, it's all about leaving a legacy. There's no way that my legacy was going to end in the 6 by 8 prison cell. I just could not have that, Steve. And if you want one of these drawings, Steve, just let me know after the show, okay? We can make it happen. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. And listen, <laughs> thank you so much. Thanks for coming on. And like I said, enjoy the rest of your life, buddy. Thank you. Take care. I called the show to get my name clear. I did five and a half years incarcerated, away from my children, and I'm just trying to get my life back. I just want my, my, I want my, who I am as a person, who I am as a person back. Being falsely accused is the reputation of who I was as a father, as a provider, as a man, you know? Um, 
nothing. I just feel good right now. I feel good that I can be able to display myself and be myself and be able to go home and knowing that what I've been falsely accused of is not true. On the night this happened, me and my ex went out, came home. I go to sleep to wake up to the police taking me, telling me to stand up and put, put my head behind my back. 3 a.m. It did 3 a.m. in the morning. You know, that's a hurtful feeling to not know what's going on. And then see your whole life transition. Everything you work hard for got destroyed, got taken away. Everything. And I'm looking around, seeing what's going on in my household. To be driven to a police car and them to tell me that my ex said I had hurt her. My ex said that night that I slashed her with a pocket knife and that I slashed her on her arms, both of her forearms. And she just sat there and then waited till I went to sleep and then she called the police. And there was no blood found on the knife. And you saying, no, I'm showing y'all that I, I didn't do it. So I'm not taking no plea deal because I didn't do it. Oh, we want to give you nine months. No, I don't want that. We want to give you a year. No, I don't want to do that. I was found guilty and I was sent to jail for seven years. I did five and a half years. In the first three years, my family didn't even know I was incarcerated. And I had a hard time. You know, I had times where I just cried and thinking about my kids sending pictures and stuff like that and getting a return, the rejection of the world during the time. And I just felt alone. I felt alone. When I got out, I rekindled my relationship with me and my girlfriend, Latoya. That's my fiance as of today. And she's the one that told me, don't stop fighting. Don't stop fighting. And I kept fighting. I kept fighting. And she said, I know you're innocent. I called Seek Wilkos because I need help to prove my innocence so I could be able to rekindle my relationship with my other five children. And it's sad because I won't even know how they look to this day if they walk past me. I haven't seen them in over 10 years. I don't know what they're doing, where their life was heading, or anything, or how they feel about me or nothing. And I've been trying to reach out, trying to find out where they at, and I don't know where they at. But I think with this right here, with Steve Wilkos helping me with this, it will rekindle me to be able to see my kids and build a relationship. And I'm here to prove him my innocence. When you watch that, what makes you so emotional? He was at the... I sat almost six years. Almost six years of my life taken away. For stuff I didn't do. I lost my kids. I did three years of parole. I had to go to Max's classes. I don't want to hurt women. I defend women. My grandmother raised me, Steve. <laughs> and all I kept doing every time I was in jail, taking them out, <laughs> looking at your video, looking at and thinking that one day I'm going to meet you. And I pray to God about it. <laughs> and I'm here in front of you today to prove my innocence, to let my babies know I love them, <laughs> and I need them back in my life. You know, a lot of times when I have people on the show and they commit or, you know, there's crimes that they've been charged with and they plead guilty to them. Oh, I, I pled guilty to 15 years in jail. Oh, I pled guilty to 10 years in jail. And I always say, well, why didn't you try to fight if you didn't do it? Because, I, I mean, I wouldn't want to go to jail for one day, let alone 10, 15, 20 years. You say you were innocent and you did fight it. And you, you rejected plea yes. deals of less than a year, a year. You could have yes. been out in a year. You fought it, and you ended up getting seven and a half years in jail. You did a little over five. Do you regret that? I don't regret me standing ten folds down. I don't regret it because I did it for my kids. Yeah. I did it for my kids, please. I would go, I would go through hell for my kids. I will fight the devil himself for my baby, Steve. And you know you're a father. You know what I mean. Had you ever been in a confrontation or a domestic violence situation with your ex before? No, we don't got no history of domestic. This is Nothing. the only time. Yeah. And the only reason why I got all that time because I wouldn't not take a plea deal. And I kept telling him. And even I'm looking at the judge, and I'm like, he even knew. It. He said, it don't even make sense. The first judge to our army said, this don't even make sense. He our army. Yeah. And it was the same one that turned around and then went with the DA to give me a felony. It went from a misdemeanor, Steve, to a felony. I was incarcerated with a guy who, did, who had three and a half to seven years 
who did a double homicide, a drink and drive and double homicide. Man. You know, when you do something bad and you go to prison, you know, I'm sure there's people like, oh, man, I, if I could go back time and not do that. But it's another thing when you go to prison, you didn't do anything and you're in there. Right. What was that like? It was like you was in the glass. If anybody can understand where I'm coming from, you can scream at the top of your lungs, mostly, and nobody can hear you. You know you what? You like in a glass jar, and don't nobody hear you because you look like a criminal. You, you know what? Like we, had a guy, we had a guy yesterday world. on the show who said the same thing. Uh, a young man we had on the show yesterday, uh, 15 years old, went to prison at 15 years old as an adult, and he said the exact same thing that you go to prison and you feel like you scream, 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 and nobody can hear nobody. it. Nobody. I mean, and, and to this day, you have no idea what happened. Like, why this person would do this to you. Not to this day, I don't know nothing about what's like going it, on with my ex. Did, that, did your ex testify in court? Yes, yeah, she testified in, she testified in trial. Okay, uh, so uh, uh, what did she say? She tried to say that I cut her. I saw uh, these pictures. And, you know, I mean, I've cut myself worse on an envelope than some of them, you know, uh, look like. I mean, they're not terrible wounds at all. Me and Freddie, we have children together. He's a great father. He changes diapers. He cooks with them. He plays with them. He's a great fiance. I don't know what, what happened with his ex, but I know that the time that me and him have been together, which is going to be four years in April, um, that we haven't had any fights or anything like that. I definitely de wouldn't deal with a man that's abusive because, you know, I, I have my children at the house as well, daughters, also sons, and I don't want my sons to grow up and think that's okay. So when he came out of jail, he definitely came over to my house and was asking, you know, to see about our son, and that became a regular thing with him seeing our son. And, you know, my feelings came back into play because I, I still was in love with him, pretty much. So we ended up getting back together. Yeah, so this is the statement that um, Freddie's ex made to the police, and I just wanted to read it. Um, Freddie assaulted me. It was about 3 or 4 a.m. in the morning. Some guys were looking at me, and Freddie got mad. He jumped on me when I was sleeping in my couch and he slashed me with a knife on both arms and threatened to kill me if I even left him. He was drinking and smoking weed and fell asleep. I called 911. The police came and they arrested him. Around August sometime, he contacted me and asked me to change my story about what happened and was intimidated, so I went along with what he wanted me to do. Sometime before this request, he did threaten me on the phone. First, he wanted me to say nothing happened or I forgot. He told me his lawyer wanted me to get in good standing with him to help him with his case. He asked me to drop charges. He wanted me to say I was too drunk and didn't remember what happened on the night he assaulted me. He also wanted me to not show up for court. He told me he was going to kill himself if he went to jail. I'm lost for words because I'm, I've been with him for these four years and I haven't seen anything, any of this, any of this that she's saying, the angriness, um, him putting his hands on her, I have not seen any of this from Freddie. So, I mean, I'm waiting to see him prove his innocence. I'm waiting for these results. Um, so you were actually in a relationship at a younger age before he was involved with this other person. We had our son. This came about with the incident. I had, I didn't see him. I didn't know what had happened. But you didn't know like he was away in, in prison. So, also, I had brain surgery, Steve. Mm -hmm. So, like, he told me, you know, we used to talk when he was not around, when he was on the run and he had to turn himself in or whatever. Right. We used to talk and he used to be working out there and he used to call ask about our son. And um, after that, I don't know what had happened. I didn't know that, you know, he went away for some time. But then he comes home, uh, you know, comes out of prison. He wants to see his son that he has with you. Right. You develop feelings for him again. Um, actually, I never stopped loving him. Oh, you never stopped loving him. I still was him. in love with him, right. So...
He's wonderful. He is awesome. He's a great father. He's a great provider. He works. I don't have to ask for anything. If, if he knows that it needs to be done, he takes care of it. Anything that's broken, he fixes it. He's the best, anything anybody can ask for. The yep. best man. When you're in prison, you watch my show. Did the other guys like me or did they hate me? It's a bunch of guys, honestly, and I'm speaking on the behalf of a lot of guys that's falsely accused they got life. Some of them looking at electric chairs. Yeah. And they just wish that they have a chance that I have right now. So right now, a whole bunch of people that knew when I was incarcerated that said I was innocent, that said God gonna get you, make sure you good, they celebrating right now. They celebrate right now. And we asked you, on the night in question, did you attack your ex with a pocket knife? You answered no. And the result for your lie detector test is that Freddie told the truth. All my babies, all my babies out, all my five babies, come and find your father and go to get in touch with Steve Wilco and we can meet, call me, get in contact with me. Daddy, love y'all. Ten toes down. Y'all got a king. I'm looking for my prince and my queen. I used to watch your show, Steve. I watched yep. your show. I used to sit up there. I just tell everybody, quiet, Steve is on. I said, I'm going to be in front of Steve. I'm going to be in front of Steve. And I do appreciate that. Um, but I, I would say, I hope for your sake that the message that you uh, sent out to your children that you haven't seen, I would hope that they see this. Um, and not to rehash what happened in the past, but you are their father. And I think it's important for children to have their father in their life. And I certainly hope that they either contact us so we can put them in touch with you. And I hope they have open hearts to maybe accept you back into their lives. Thank Thanks you. Thanks for so coming on. Good luck. Over 20 years ago, James was accused of first degree rape. He was convicted of this. He served 10 years. He served his time. James and I reconnected three years ago. We married in June. He told me that he was um, accused of first degree rape. He was accused of holding her at gunpoint for two days. I don't believe Jim did any of this. I will never believe he did any of this. I know Jim personally from when we were young children. I know the type of man he is. He respects women. He's shy. He's laid back, he's a great man. I wouldn't bring my grandchildren around him if I didn't believe that he was a safe man or if I believed that any of this was true. All I really know about this crime is that it's false. She filed false, she filed all lies. Um, there's proof in the paperwork, um, but the judge, the lawyers, for some reason didn't find him innocent. They just sent him away. At first I wanted to wait to get married until the lie detector test was taken, but I love him so much and I believe in him so much that I did marry him. The thing that really bothers me is he has to continue to register as a level two sex offender, which he is not. This is something that follows us everywhere. He can't get a job. I. I can't get a place to live. I'm living in a hotel because we can't find a home because of this. It is horrible. Living in a hotel is horrible. My children, my grandchildren having to live in a hotel, go to school from a hotel is, we've been fighting this for a year trying to find a home and it's become so impossible. And every time I find something good, they do a background check and he, we lose everything. If Steve reads those results, and they are true, I honestly don't know what I'm gonna do. I will feel heartbroken. I would not marry a man like this, and I would do everything to protect my grandchildren before I let any man into their life that has been accused of something this bad. He best not fail this test. Uh, James, that's your wife on the tape. Are you guilty of this crime that you did 10 years in jail for? No, sir. Uh. Have you ever been accused of any kind of sexual abuse or had been in any legal trouble before your rape charge? No, sir. No. So you, you had a clean past? Yes, sir. Uh, so when you go back to the night in question when this uh, rape accusation or charge against you, uh, what happened between you and your ex? Um, well, it was, a, it was a 
pretty much a normal night, I guess. I'm, I was going to, uh, for classes to get my GED. We, I had an essay due on Friday. Uh, we both went, we had done a couple of shots and she had read the essay that I had due on Friday. We had went to bed, I mean, Thursday before I went to work, we had intercourse. After that, that night, Thursday night, went to bed and woke up the next morning and there was three police officers in my bedroom pointing a revolver at me. But what, what did you think? I couldn't believe it. Uh. I mean, you're, everything's fine one minute, you wake up the following day and the next thing you're being accused of something that did not happen. What exactly were the, what was the situation that she painted to the police? That she was held at gunpoint and held for several hours and raped. Did you own a gun? No. You didn't have a gun in the house? Yes, there was. Whose gun was it? It was a friend of mine. I was in the process of getting my dealership license for automobiles and I wanted to get a pistol permit to leave here. Well, to leave there, well, I was up in Canada or down south buying vehicles, so I went to a friend who had a pistol permit, and I showed it, and she, that's when everything went crazy. So this friend gave you a gun and you kept it in the house? I only had it for less than 24 hours. But the ex didn't like that you had the gun in the house? No, but she knew when we first got together that I wanted a dealership license and I wanted a pistol permit. So you think she just wanted to get rid of you? I'm assuming that's one of the reasons why she did it. And so, so did you uh, plead guilty? I didn't have a choice. What do you mean you didn't have a choice? You always I have a I wanted to go to trial. Yes, you're absolutely correct. I wanted to go to trial. My attorney didn't because uh, the arresting officers took a statement and you could take my statement and her statement and put them together and they'd almost be identical. Okay, but and the when point he, is, when he the came judge me, said, are you guilty? My attorney told me that I should say yes. And so you said yes. I was never been in trouble before. I was supposed to. And you said yes. Yes, I did. You took a lie detector test, right? Yes, I did. Any chance you're gonna fail? No. You, 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 but she's saying, man, if, if you fail, you might be out the door. Maybe not, but you might be out the door. Well, if I fail, then I don't know what to tell you. I'm not gonna make up a story. Okay, wasn't let's meet way. your wife, Christina. I'm gonna be with you all the way. Amy, thank you. I love you. I love you too, and I appreciate every, all the support. So, Christina, you have two young granddaughters, right? Yes, sir. And, and they live with you? Yes, sir. For whatever various circumstances, you, you, they, you're raising them. I am raising them. Okay, and you had known uh, years ago that he went to prison, and he says, hey, I gotta register as a sex offender. It's not gonna be easy. Yes, and, but I just don't understand why you pled guilty. I, that's the one big thing that's bothered me the most. I don't understand it. If you didn't do it, why did you plead guilty? I didn't have a choice. Okay, my mother let's, stop, always, let's stop saying that. There's you always had a choice. Then I'll explain yeah. it. My choice was this. It's either I go to trial, put my mother who's dying of cancer in a wheelchair on a stand, and I wasn't going to have it. You weren't going to put your mother on the I was stand? not going to put my mother through So that. you said, I'll do 10 years in jail. I swallowed my pride. Oh, man, come on. I, so you got to say something better than that. I'm having a hard that's, time dealing with that. Listen, well, if my truth. mother and father both were dying of cancer on their last day of their life, I'd have put them on a the stand so I wouldn't go to jail. And your mother would want to go to jail. She, did she really want to say, I'm dying of cancer, so put my boy in prison, I'll never see him again? No. No, because the day that I had to plead guilty, she stopped her chemotherapy treatments. Right, she gave up. It's but I right. add that he was never been in trouble so before that. So let me ask that. you this, Christina. Here, you know, right. on the tape, you're like, there we go. I would never put my granddaughters in this position, and we're living in a motel. It's so hard. As much as you love James, why would you make it so hard for yourself and your granddaughters to be with the registered sex offender that impacts your life, impacts your granddaughter's life? Why would you be with someone that just makes your life so hard at this stage of your life. Because I believe he's innocent 100%. And it wasn't his fault that we were homeless. That was gonna end up happening to me either way. Right, because of other situations right. and circumstances. And you said on the tape, if he fails for some reason, what, what, would, what would your decision be? He's done his time, he's served his time. So you would stay with him? I'd stay with him. Even if he did? Yes. Okay. But I don't believe he did. 
James, we gave you a lot of detective tests and we mm -hmm. asked you, on the night that you were arrested, did you hold an ex-girlfriend at gunpoint? You answered no. On the night that you were arrested, did you have sexual intercourse with that ex-girlfriend? You answered no. The results of your lie detector test, the uh, results came back the same to each question, and they came back that James told the truth. I knew you did. I got no reason to lie. <laughs> I wasn't raised that way. But go on. Just hearing the story, I'm talking, like I said, I was talking to my wife about it. I said, uh -huh. it's very unusual that yeah. anybody How do you think gets convicted of this. And, and that's where I just go back to, was it worth not fighting it and spend 10 years in prison? I mean, you got to have some regrets about not fighting it, right? I have a lot of regrets, Steve. Yeah. But you see, my mother came first. Your mother would gladly taken her last breath on that stand I think to she keep you too. out of jail. The person that did this to you, I hope they watch this and they feel terrible for what they did to you. They stole 10 years out of your life stole part of your mother's life, and, and that's I that's actually hor stole the rest of my life, and six years ago when I ran into that individual, they're telling me they've gone on with their lives. Why haven't I gone on with mine? I can't. Right. It's tough. It's tough with this situation. I hope appearing on the show today and, you know, whoever had doubts about you uh, sees this results for you. I hope that Thank your you situation... So somehow could improve i don't know maybe you go somewhere and you try to get your record expunged or whatever i don't know if that's even possible but i just hope that this between the two of you helps you i'm thank glad you. you came on the show take care thank you i love you thank you good luck to you, you too. thank you so much josetta spent four years in prison for first and second degree child abuse she confessed to causing multiple injuries that led to a fractured skull on her then three-month-old son but that's not all she also confessed to abusing another child, giving him a lacerated scalp and a swollen forehead. Her kids were adopted out. One was even taken away at birth. But despite the confessions, Josetta says she didn't do any of this and is here to clear her name. Take a look. The hardest day of my life was October 17th, 1996, when I came home and found my child, three-month-old child, with a dent in his head, and I had no idea, like, what happened. At that point, I was living with my boyfriend of 10 months. The boyfriend told me that he laid on the bottle. And then he told me that the baby had a nosebleed, and I'm like, how does a three-month-old have a nosebleed? But anyways, I ran to the hospital with my son. The nurse came out and she just looked at him and she said, your son was abused. And I flipped out. Maybe 10 minutes after I got there, the police came and they were questioning me. And they said, well, what happened? Do you know who did this? Did you do this? And I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know what's going on. The police told me that my son had a fractured skull and bruising. Another child that was residing in our home had a laceration on his head and bruising. After I found that out, the family member of the ex-boyfriend told me to please say it was me because if I didn't, that person would get a lot of time in jail and never be released. I was scared, so I agreed and I, I, I confessed. But I regret it. After the confession, I got two 10-year sentences, first-degree child abuse, second-degree child abuse. I got four years in jail for something I didn't even do. Like, I was there for about a year and a half, and a lawyer came out of nowhere, and he got my sentence reduced. And I just kept fighting. Like, every year that I was home from jail, I fought to get my kids. But I never regained custody, full custody of my kids. This charge follows me everywhere, every day. 23 years of being rejected because of something that shouldn't have happened in the first place is hard. 
I have to ask the question, why, why are you here? In all these years, I had watched my kids grow without me. I don't even think that I'm a good person anymore because my, my kids were taken because of something I did, something I confessed to saying I did something, although I know I didn't. What's the point of reliving all this all over again? The point of reliving it is I want a, a relationship, a close relationship with my sons. It may not be... Because is, is this holding it back? Because of what you confessed to? Yes. Okay. And, um... Because Vinny and you seem like you have a decent relationship. Yeah. Okay. So my question to you is, you know, like, I know bits and pieces of the story. You were with a guy that you only knew 10 months. Right. And uh, maybe he did this, right? Right. These, th these things. Somebody talked to you and said, hey, if he takes the fall for this, he's going to go to jail for a long time. Will you take the fall? And you'll do less time. No, they told me I wouldn't do any. All right. Did you really believe that? I did. And then, so you believed that you wouldn't take any time, and you went to, you were sentenced to how many years? I had two 10 year sentences concurrent, seven years to serve, three probation. And how many years did you serve? Four. Four. Now, so this is a guy you knew 10 months, right? Right. Who obviously must have been a bad guy at some point that he had these uh, criminal record. I didn't know that. Okay. Well, you should know it. I should, but you I didn't. You should know who you're bringing around your kids. And this is true, you but I didn't. You... Okay, but you should. Okay. Explain to me how you would go to the police, how you would go to court and say, yeah, I did this. First of all, I didn't go to the police and say I did anything. Um, I was, a, I, was I guess confess, it was called though? interrogated for three days. I just broke down. I couldn't take it anymore. And that's a shame because they told me that if I did say it, that my kids would come home. I would leave with, my, with them. I, 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 I didn't think so anything else. So are you saying else. the police made you confess? I'm not saying anyone, uh, like, the police made me confess. I'm saying they, I don't know how they do it, but they... <laughs> say these things, these awful things to you, and then next thing you know, they're your friend. Then next thing you know, they're saying something awful to you. Then they're your friend, you know? So you're thinking, well, this is my friend. Yeah, she's telling me I'm going to be able to go home. Well, guess what? That's what I thought. Wouldn't it have just been so easy for you to be like, that guy did it? I did do that. I did that plenty of times. And I even did that when I was getting sentenced. Your husband Stanley is here, right? Yes. How is she as a mother to your son? She's the best mother I've ever seen in my life. There you go. She loves her kids. She wants to have a relationship with her kids. She'll say Scotty's saying whatever to whoever. She tried to have a relationship with him. She wants the truth for her kids. That's right. what she wants. Okay, let's find out. All right, uh, Vinny, your mother, you know, came here. She took a lie detector test. All right. And we're going to get to these results. Is there anything you want to say before I read these results? This is it. OK. So concerning the one child, Josetta, uh, in October 1996, did you cause any of the injuries to that other child? You answered no. In October 1996, did you witness anyone cause any injuries to that other child? You answered no. Did you ever strike that other child causing a lacerated scalp? You answered no. Did you ever strike that other child causing a swollen forehead? You answered no. The results came back the same to each one of those four questions, and it came back that Josetta told the truth. Okay. Don't cry. There's no need to cry. Okay. There's no need. Okay. He's strong. I'm ready. Uh, Josetta, uh, this is for uh, your lie detector test for Scotty. And we asked you, in October of 1996, did you cause any of the injuries to your then 
three-month-old son? You answered no. In October of 1996, did you witness anyone cause any injuries to your then three-month-old son? You answered no. Did you ever strike your then three-month-old son causing a skull fracture? You answered no. Did you ever strike your then three-month-old son causing marks or bruises? You answered no. The results came back the same to each one of those four questions, and it came back that Josetta told the truth. It's okay, huh? Come on. She's out. I think we might want to get right? uh, Medic. Medic. Are you all right? Yeah, she's not all right. Come on. Come on. Hello. Hey. Let's call someone. Hey. Let's get a bus. Hey. Look, look at me. Look at me. It was a scare. You passed out when I, after I read the results. Um, you were checked out by our paramedics. Uh, we called the town paramedics and they checked you out. Are you okay to continue doing the show? Yes. Okay. You feel okay? Yes. All right. I hope you. I hope this has been worth it to you to come on the show. Absolutely. <laughs> and uh, you know these results. You, you know you came. You told the truth. You passed. Amen. You need to forgive yourself, and you need to move on with your life. Thank you, that. Steve. At just 20 years old, Jeremy was arrested and charged with capital murder in the death of 18-year-old Jessica Curran. Oh. Jessica's body was found beaten, raped, and burned. Oh. Jeremy spent three years in prison, but then all charges against him were dropped. Now, nearly 20 years later, another man is serving a life sentence for kidnapping, raping, and murdering Jessica. But Jeremy says people still believe that he is the true killer and the wrong man is behind bars. Take a look. Police say 18-year-old Jessica Melissa Curran died from multiple blows to the body. Investigators say she was assaulted and her body set on fire. Police say the crime happened behind the Mayfield Middle School early Sunday morning. So far, police say there are no motives. I was falsely accused of, of a horrific murder that I did not commit. A, a woman that I had a one night stand with a year prior to her death, she was brutally raped, murdered, set on fire, and thrown behind a middle school in a small town in Kentucky. Uh, one night me and my girlfriend broke up. I, I got mad at her, I took, I, took, I took a walk. I heard some female voices uh, call, calling, my, uh, calling at me, you know, hey, hey, come here. Well, I asked the girl if they smoke weed. They both replied, yes, we do. The, the, the black female, she offered her hand. I kissed it, it melted her. She fell for it immediately. So we smoked, we partied, we had a ball. We enjoyed each other's company. We had sex. That's all I know of the woman. That's, uh, that's all I know her. I didn't even know her last name. She introduced herself as Jessie. That's all I know. A year goes by and I'm sitting there and I watch the news, a glamour shot pops up on the television. I don't recognize the girl at the, at, at, at the time and I pay no mind to it. I made no connection that it was the woman that I had sex with a, a year prior. She was beaten. According to the news, she was beaten, she was raped, she was, she was bludgeoned to death, she was strangled, she was stabbed. Everything was done to this woman. It blew my mind. Later on, uh, I, I'm arrested on August the 4th of 2000. I had been on the run for a, a, a prior drug charge and I bail jumped. I didn't go back to court, I just I ran. Anyway, long story short, they take, normally they take you straight to jail. They took me straight to the police station talking about a murder and then I'm supposed to have a child by this woman that, that had passed away. I said, man, you lost your mind. The police, they come to me and they show me the pictures of this woman's mutilated body. I have never seen something so horrific in my life. So I went back to my cell in a shocked state. I started discussing these photos with my cellmate. He contacted the police and said that I confessed to a murder. Two weeks later, the police indicted me for a capital murder that I did not commit. They said, I would not have known this type of information unless I would have been at the crime scene. Why would I not when you just showed me the, the photos of her mutilated body? Now here I am, just the ripe age of 20, uh, 20 years old, I'm facing the death penalty. These people are trying to kill me with, not, not a long, with only one piece of evidence. This guy saying that I confessed to a murder that I did not commit. 
man, I give you my word to God. I ain't, I ain't, I ain't never killed nobody in my life. Never have, never will. Jeremy, you were arrested for capital murder, um, but the charges were dropped. Yes, sir. What happened before your trial? The day before my trial was scheduled to begin, my lawyers came to me and they told me that she was filing for dismissal in the case because 18 crucial, crucial pieces of evidence had been withheld from my lawyer. Each piece said physically that I was not, an, uh, that I was not a guilty party in this scenario. I have never taken another life in my life, bro. And I never will. So the very next day, the case was thrown out. The prosecution said if my lawyer had not had filed for the dismissal in the case, that he himself would have filed for, for dismissal. When my case was dismissed, the judge himself threatened to fire the prosecution because he said, you mean to tell me you brought this man the right 20, year, 20 years old? brought this man before my courtroom, and you don't have one piece of evidence to support your theory that this man is guilty of capital murder? Capital murder means that you're facing the death penalty. You go out one night, you have a one night stand, right? Yes, sir. You have sex with this girl. Um, a year later, she ends up dead, brutally murdered, raped, burned. Um, you get charged with the crime, even though you're like, I haven't seen her. Uh, you saw her on TV that she was murdered, but she got pregnant with your child. Yes. And you had no idea. Absolutely none whatsoever. When did you find out that she had your baby? The police came to me, and the police, when I, when, like I said, on the, uh, like three days after she was, she was murdered, when I get to the police station, the FBI sits before me. So I'm like, and they begin to question me on a, on a murder. I'm like, man, they're saying that the victim has a baby by me. And, and, and at first, I thought they lost their mind. You see what I'm saying? Because that glamour shot that you see right there, I was not making the connection that that was the same woman that I she had. Did, she didn't look like that. She didn't look right. like that. That's a glamour shot. That don't look like her in real life. And they said, would you be willing to take a DNA test to clear your name in this scenario? I said, absolutely. So we left from the jail after viewing several photos of her mutilated body, we go straight, and, there, and there, was, there was DNA found under her nails that did not match me. So I asked him, do you have another photo of this woman other than the one that you saw? When I look at it, my heart drops. Because within her arms is a child, and his eyes penetrated my soul because I know my eyes, I know my baby when I see him one. So, from that point on, I never denied that that child was mine. And for every day for the last 20 years, I have tried to be a part of that child's life, but have been denied. He came here today to clear his name because mm -hmm. due to his relationship with this young woman that was murdered, mm -hmm. he wants a relationship with the child that he's never met, mm -hmm. who's his son. He came here to clear his name. If, and, and I put a lot of stock into our show's lie detector test. If he passes, would you believe the results? No. I mean, not to sound cruel, I don't give a damn about you. You seem like an okay guy. Right. I wouldn't want to live next door. Yeah, I'm not going <laughs> to you know, like lie. Right? You know? I mean, you know. So what I'm saying is, as we always have done, we, no bias in this with us. Whatever this result is, is this man came here to either clear his name or get blown up. Get blown up, man. Because hey. if you're if you are facing murder, and you would come here, that little clause on they national put, television, that little clause <laughs> they put in his uh, release saying, come you know, on, we're bro. dismissing this with prejudice, meaning we could come back after your ass, right? What? So if he would fail, I think that would give them that's a risk, especially ain't it? this guy. Ain't that a risk? A lot of motivation to go back and put this guy in jail. So Jeremy did come here and took a lie detector test. And we asked him, when you had sex with Jessica in 1999, was it consensual? You answered yes. Did you cause Jessica's death? You answered no. Did you participate in any way in Jessica's death? You answered no. 
The results of your lie detector tests, uh, all the results came back the same, and they came back that Jeremy told the truth. <laughs> Time and time again, of this horrific crime that I did not commit, had no involvement whatsoever. And because of the way my case was dismissed, the police didn't go back on, on television and say, hey, we charged the wrong man when they later charged, tried, and convicted this other man. They didn't say, I'm sorry. They just left it out in the open. Being that I was the one that originally charged in the case, they left it for the community to decide, and it left doubt in the community. That is my purpose for being here today, to clear my name in the eyes of the world. I called you, Steve, for help because I watch your show all the time. Somebody's gonna watch this and say, you know what, she was brave enough to do that, I can do that too.